Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. I confess that there are times when I feel like I'm trying to hold back the tide. That the message that I seek to bring in and through uh, all the work that we do at Dunamis Fellowship, including this podcast, that the message of the gospel is obscured and hidden uh, in the rhetoric of the day. I have watched as uh, Christians have assaulted and attacked Christians, of course, through social media over issues of social justice over issues of masking or not masking, over issues of uh, opening for public worship or not opening for public worship, over voting for Trump or not voting for Trump. These kinds of things have been fed into uh, that meat grinder that is the social media And the sausage that has come out is not pleasant. Now, I've mentioned before that on just about every one of those issues, not all of them, I don't pretend to understand the the science related to COVID-19, but on a number of those issues, I've, I've got my perspectives. And from time to time, I'll let them out to play. But I want to be sure that never, ever will these positions cause us to lose sight or obscure the glory of the peace that we have with our Heavenly Father. I don't want to be fighting with my brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to be encouraging my brothers and sisters in Christ, and I want to be fighting against the forces of evil. I don't want to be fighting against the devil. I want to be fighting first against my own sin. I want all of us to recognize that's what we should all be doing. You know, when everybody's hooting and hollering and yelling and screaming against the other guy, it's very difficult to look to our own sins. I'm not sure where it was, but recently I read something that I thought was incredibly astute and helpful. They said something like this. If you are reading the imprecatory Psalms and your first thought is to list out your enemies that you want to see the living God destroy. You may very well be doing it wrong. Now, I'm not taking some mamby-pamby, uh, Lewisian perspective that the imprecatory Psalms are wrong. Of course they're not wrong. Nor am I going to take the perspective that Jesus is not about the business of destroying all of his enemies. The position I'm taking is that so many of his enemies are inside of us. That when I look at the children that I have born out of my pride, little baby sins that have been nursed by pride, I want to pray, oh Lord, dash their heads against a rock. I need to be fixed. 
I want the message of Dunamis Fellowship to reflect the wisdom of G.K. Chesterton, who once said, you ask what's wrong with the world. I am. That's what's wrong with the world. Now, friends, when everybody's in a frenzy, well, everybody that's in the same frenzy with you wants to join with you, wants to support with you, wants to come alongside you, wants to be in that bunker with you. But when you're trying to give calm, peaceful, reasonable, and most of all, biblical counsel in the midst of these screaming matches, you're often just seen like an annoyance. But I believe that you who listen to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, I believe at least some of the time that you're in agreement with me. I believe that some of the time uh, you're able, as some of the time I'm able, to set aside these fierce debates and stop and think about our own sins. And I believe that just like I like talking about these things, that you like hearing about these things. Which is why today, as we do once a week, we stop and ask if you would consider partnering with us with Dunamis Fellowship. Dunamis is the Greek word which means power. It's used to describe the resurrection power of Jesus. It comes to us in the English as dynamite. Well, the dynamite I want to explode is that which blows up our failures, our weaknesses, our pride, so that we can proclaim the message of Jesus who heals all those who come to him. Will you consider supporting the work of Dunamis Fellowship? It's easy to do. Just visit rcsproljr.com and click on the donate button, and it'll hold your hand through the whole process. Thanks for listening. You know, it's funny that one of my, well, one of many people's common complaints about uh, Christian movies is the lack of character development. That all too often uh, Christian movies end up being uh, good people having good times and then facing one struggle and coming through it. And you don't see a lot of uh, growth amongst those characters. I'm not saying it never happens, I'm just saying it's rare. But I mentioned that because in today's curating your movie library, I'd like to talk about a secular movie uh, that I've watched, that I've enjoyed, that oddly has something of the same problem, but I like it anyway. In fact, it's one of the most interesting things about the movie. The movie I'm speaking of is called Mr. Deeds. And Mr. Deeds, oh gosh, it's probably close to 20 years old, uh, Mr. Deeds stars Adam Sandler, who's not known for uh, highbrow, sophisticated humor. And this is not highbrow, sophisticated humor. Uh, but it's neither is it crass or raunchy or anything uh, inappropriate. So I, I, I don't want you to be afraid of that. I don't want you to be turned off by the fact that it is Adam Sandler. Check it out, and uh, you'll find it uh, clean and uh, enjoyable and funny. I mean, I very much liked it. Lisa liked it, too. I'm sorry, by the way. She's not able to be with me for this particular segment, but she enjoyed it. I had, I had seen it before, and I'm introducing her to it. I said, hey, this is here. Let's look at this. It's pretty funny. Uh, the gist of the story is that uh, the Adam Sandler character, Mr. Deeds, uh, this is not that much of an unusual uh, uh, storyline, but he's just a, an unassuming small-town guy who has his own pizzeria 
and is content with his life when all of a sudden uh, he inherits billions of dollars. And he's swept up by uh, you know, the CEO and other high ups in the, this distant family member's business and brought into the city and uh, pursued by the news uh, as a, you know, a, a big story. So, the, so you've got this set up and you would think, wouldn't you, that uh, in this kind of a story, Mr. Deeds would uh, be tainted by the wealth that he's received and uh, have his comeuppance and perhaps uh, change his ways and then have everything restored at the end. Mm, it's not how it goes. Mr. Deeds is sweet and gentle and unassuming and humble and giving and caring at the beginning of the movie. 10 minutes into the movie, 20 minutes into the movie, halfway through the movie, three quarters of the way through the movie, at the end of the movie. There's no change. He's I mean, I remember watching this. I've, I've seen it before, as I said, but the, this last time that I watched it with Lisa, I remember thinking, oh, golly, Ned's that. That guy's just the sweetest, nicest guy. He never does anything wrong. Well, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but... He's such a sweet, tender-hearted guy. I don't know that I've ever seen some. I wonder if the writers, if the people in Hollywood, if they're aware of this and how unusual this is in the movies, in secular movies. Doesn't Hollywood typically delight to sort of pop the bubbles of those who appear to be good? I suspect that uh, Mr. Deeds owes a lot of its uh, ethos uh, to the movies of Frank Capra. Not just It's a Wonderful Life, though, including It's a Wonderful Life, but also uh, Meet John Doe and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Uh, all of them stories of men who uh, are not sort of by, by dint of their stiff upper lip and zeal and passion and commitment incorruptible, but they're incorruptible because of their fundamental innocence. They're just sweet and kind. I think Mr. Deeds is supposed to be like one of those movies, and I think they did an outstanding job. The humor was great. The actors were great. Lots of good actors in this uh, show. John Turturro uh, has a supporting role as the, the butler, and he does a great job. Uh, uh, Winona Ryder is the love interest, and she does a wonderful job. Uh, but for me, you know, it was all about Mr. Deeds. It was all about the Adam Sandler character. And I just felt like I want to be like that guy. There is something uh, profoundly childlike about his innocence. Doesn't mean that he was foolish. It doesn't mean that he didn't. He wasn't responsible. But he wasn't always trying to guard and protect what was his. He assumed the best in others, even when they weren't doing well by him. And the sheer power of that innocence is that by which he was able to defeat those who were trying to bring him down. You know, it feels a little weird to be this strongly uh, commending an Adam Sandler movie, well, especially when it's 20-some years old. But there you have it. That's my response. I hope you'll check it out. And as always, I hope you'll let us know what you thought about Mr. Deeds. Are there any gray areas from God's point of view? Is everything a matter of right and wrong from God's perspective? How do we determine issues that would be gray? Well, no, there are no gray areas from God's point of view. 
neither should there be any gray areas from our point of view. There are, however, issues that are not moral issues. Suppose, for instance, that the dictionary suggests that both G-R-E-Y and G-R-A-Y are fitting spellings for that color that is somewhere between black and white. If I choose G-R-E-Y over G-R-A-Y, I have not fallen into G-R-A-Y or G-R-E-Y matter. If I asked you to pick a number from 1 to 10, I can't imagine what sin I could charge you with should you choose 7 or 2 or in fact any number from 1 to 10. This does not mean that these are what we call gray matters. These are instead what we call adiaphora, matters not touching on morals. This is important to understand, especially when we find ourselves trying to make important decisions. We're so eager to know God's will that we sometimes seek that will where he has not spoken. When a person is trying to decide, should I take this job or that? Should I buy this house or that? My counsel is usually try to discern if either choice is sinful. If neither is, do the spiritual thing and do what you want. That said, we often fall off the other side of the horse by forgetting to apply broader moral principles. That is, we may think to ourselves, if the Bible does not say, thou shalt not buy the house on 13 Mockingbird Lane, then it must not be a sin, when in fact, it could be a sin. Perhaps the house is more than you can afford, and buying it would be poor stewardship. Perhaps it sits right next to a cigar store, and you have in the past allowed tobacco to rule over you, and wisdom suggests you flee temptation. This kind of moral calculus can certainly be subtle. It can lead us into some deep waters. God, of course, always knows what is right. We don't always know, but we should. Now, suppose I think it is foolish to buy the house, but you think it is wise. Suppose we break out our moral calculus and are not able to agree. But suppose that we can agree that it is a close call, that it looks from our limited perspective to be, quote, gray. Such ought to mean that we not get in a horrible tussle over the issue. It does not mean, however, that it really is gray, that there's no right answer. Let me give you a real life example. Head coverings. I believe that the Bible teaches that husbands should have their wives cover their heads when we gather together for corporate worship. I believe it for exegetical reasons and for historical reasons. I think those who don't so believe are wrong on the issue, wrong in their exegesis, and wrong in their understanding of history. I also think, however, that many of the men who hold this different view are far more godly than I am. I'm willing to concede that some things in the Bible are more clear than others, and that the case against head coverings isn't completely out in left field. There's still a right and wrong, and God knows it clearly. But God has made it clear that we ought not to be jumping down each other's throats on matters that he has made less clear to us. How do we know which issues are less clear? Ah, there's the rub. In most disagreements, the real disagreement is here. Is it a matter of indifference? Is it clear? Well, one helpful hint for my own practice is once again to look to church history. If the church has felt that issue X is clear and important, 
I want to submit to that. If the church has recognized the issue to be less clear, I want to treat it that way. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsproljr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.